and here he is speaking in a hardware conference. Um, but in fact, that makes perfect sense, does it not? I think so. I think so for, for two reasons. One is, um, I think that a lot of what is being discussed here and around this project um, was made possible by software. And so the particular innovation around open source, um, the particular kind of the sledgehammer effect that Linux has had on the, on the market um, makes possible a lot of, of, of what we're all talking about uh, with what's happening in hardware now. Um, the other thing that I just think is so incredibly important is the implications of open source plus uh, open hardware um, for uh, you know, radical reductions, as I know uh, Mark Zuckerberg talked about yesterday, radical reductions in price uh, and cost uh, for building systems, um, which then makes it possible for software to do many more things that it was able to do before. Um, so when I think most software rates in the world, um, I think about software becoming much more important in fundamental industries, education, healthcare, financial services, uh, media, um, you know, many, many other areas of uh, business, um, and being able to have uh, very inexpensive hardware at high volume makes it possible to build a lot of software, um, and that software become much more important in the world. So to take that cycle even further, what that does, you know, driving down the cost of hardware, that feeds this new breed of cloud services, right. which allows me, if I'm a startup, to be off the ground so much easier, right? Um, I don't have to buy hardware, I don't have to buy servers and storage gear, and and, and networking here. So you think that the future is <coughs> are these cloud services, um, and that the data center, so to speak, uh, is dead, at least for the smaller ones. Well, so we see it every day. So we see two things every day. So one is we, we see it's become a cliche, but it's absolutely true, is we see startups uh, come in doing some sort of fundamental new software innovation, again, often in very important areas like education or healthcare. Um, and it's you know two or three or four kids um, with their laptops, and the laptops are their entire capex budget for the company for the first two years. Like that's it, um, and they're deploying entirely onto cloud services. They are, by the way, their business also is running entirely on cloud. That's the other thing is, you know, all of the companies are running entirely on system Salesforce.com, uh, Box.net, you know, Google Apps. Um, we just back new company Zenfits, which is a cloud-based service, comprehensive for HR and uh, benefits. And so these new companies can basically all run entirely on the cloud both for their own purposes and for all the business apps that they need. So as a consequence, the amount of money required to start a new software business, I mean, is, is tiny in comparison to any historical precedent. You know, $500,000 gives these companies two years of runway to be able to develop their product. Um, we see on the other side, though, with the companies that are scaling. And so I see this Mark talked about this issue. I see this every, every time I go to Facebook board meeting, it's like an out-of-body experience for me. Um, because I look at the CapEx budget of Facebook, and in one sense, it's you know a lot of money, because Facebook's buying a lot of hardware. Um, on the other hand, um, had Facebook existed, you know, in 1999, the CapEx budget would be somewhere 50 or 100 times bigger than it is. You know, Facebook would be spending like $100 billion a year on capital equipment, which of course is impossible, which means, of course, Facebook could not have existed in 1999. So then I think when you project forward and you look out 10 years, um, you, you basically start to ask this a really interesting question, which is if services like Facebook and Google are made possible today, uh, because of much uh, lower cost, higher volume hardware, um, and then you project the curves for hardware over the next 10 years, the services that are going to be made possible 10 years from now are going to be mind-blowing in their sophistication and their power, and they're going to make things that we you know, think today are very powerful and compelling and completely trivial in comparison. So we're entering, I think, an entirely new era for what software is going to be able to do as a direct result of what's happening in hardware. So how about you, Andy? Do you sell hardware into the data center? Are you of the opinion that the data center is dead? Some used to sell hardware to the data center. Um, now, the, historically, most computers were bought by businesses, you know, one at a time, and um, there was a great business for computer companies until about, I don't know, five, five ten years ago, let's just say. These days, the computer is the data center, right? It's no longer an individual computer, it's the whole thing. And what the traditional IT industry kind of missed here is that it's a completely different optimization required to build things cost effectively for the very large scale data centers. Then, if you sell one at a time, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's Dell or HP or IBM, because IBM sold the hardware business. So, um, and at scale, you know, you can optimize for power, efficiency, connectivity, uh, fabrics in a very different way. At the same time, you know, the spending has actually shifted. So, if you look at where the growth in the market is for hardware vendors, uh, the traditional IT business is actually either not growing at all or declining, or it's, it's basically flat to declining. All the growth is in the cloud, so the cloud capex budgets for uh, Facebook, Google, and so if you can take the, the largest six US public uh, cloud companies, it has been growing 35% year over year over year. And if one extrapolates this a couple of years in the future, it's only actually predicted that the cloud capex spending 
in, by 2020, I believe, will exceed all the North American carriers combined. So all the stuff that you know, Verizon and at and is putting into the ground or into the wireless station is actually smaller than what these six cloud companies are going to spend just on enabling software. So all the action these days is based in the cloud, and uh, what my most recent company is doing is focusing on network switching for that segment of the market, which is what we call cloud networking. Uh, but again, even there, we have to optimize equipment to have the capacity and the power efficiency and the cost performance to make sense, whereas the more traditional kind of network equipment was actually off by a decent order of magnitude. So what we're also seeing is that the networking world is a separation of the hardware and the software, not just what we saw with servers, um, now we're seeing bare metal switches where you can put um, any software you like on. So how do you see that world um, you know, changing the way we do things? Is that the epoxy question? It is. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, networking, I think it makes a lot of sense to stand up as network hardware. And basically, uh, companies like Broadcom and Intel have built chipsets that most people are using. There's still a few companies that are building their own chips, but that's sort of a legacy model. Um, so if you have a standard chipset, it looks more or less like a standard, say, Intel server, and the hardware isn't actually that different. But the thing about networking is you need a software stack that actually works. So building the software stack is actually a lot harder than, than the hardware. And I was directly saying that hardware is easy, software is hard. And, and it's really true. Like 90% of our engineers are working on the software stack. It's like 400 people slaving away working on networking software. And a very, very small team is working on the hardware. So the hardware is actually not the difficult part, but it, it does help to standardize it for sure. And so Mark, where do you see that, that world going? Will you see a continued separation there? Um, and what might that lead to down the road in the networking world? Yeah, so Andy, Andy, Andy has forgotten more about networking today than I have learned in my entire life. So I'm going to be very cautious about how far I go out on this one. Um, but I would say, like, we believe deeply in the structural change. And the same structural change has happened, that happened in servers happening in, in networking. Um, so we have two companies in particular that we, that we work with that we, we think are right on the edge of this. Um, Nasira uh, has now become a brand name as a consequence of having been bought by VMware, but we think Nasira is fundamental for this new generation of software-based uh, networking, so-called software-defined networking. Um, and we think the great rollout of software-defined networking is, is, is just starting and it's going to have enormous implications for, for the networking industry. Uh, the other company we have uh, launched on uh, actually on Monday is here, is here at this conference, uh, Cumulus uh, Networks, which of course is bringing Linux. Uh, into the switch um, and uh, and uh, you know launched uh, I think to uh, to, to uh, great excitement this week, um, including the partnership with Bell. Um, and so we basically see the same you know basically if you if you look at what happened to servers, if you look at what happened with Linux, to Andy's point, if you look at what happened to servers with chip standardization uh, with Intel CPUs, we think the same the same general process is starting to roll through the networking business. So first servers, now networking, and I guess the next step is storage. Yeah, so we think storage is next up. Before you go, you're from different um, there is actually one uh, topic in networking that uh, is a good example of how important open compute uh, is and, and, and will be in the future, which is the traditional standards group that have standardized networking are the people at the IEEE, there's this committee IEEE in the middle three, and you know, they have like 50 or 100 people with gray beards traveling around the world, meeting every six weeks to decide <laughs> what the future of Ethernet is. Well, the problem is they have a voting rule where unless 70% of the people admitting vote for something, there's no change. So they've been trying to standardize on cheaper optics now for the last two plus years. They had like, you know, dozens of meetings. And in the end, they could not make a vote because nobody had the 70% majority for any one of the proposals represented. So this is an example where a standards group has failed their own objective, which is to deliver the next standard to make things cheaper. Now at open compute, this would have never happened because if somebody had a better idea how to make cheaper optics, they could just publish the spec and saying, here it is, and it's available and it's a standard that's being published, instead of having this gate where you know, 70 out of 100 people are really have to agree to make a change. So I, I like the open computer approach to standardization where it's a very inclusive kind of approach where you know, Microsoft is a better idea to make yet another crack server. That's great, that's added to the list. And I think one thing we've learned here is one doesn't have to narrow it down to one particular proposal. There's a lot of innovation potential, both at the packaging side, the silicon side, the you know, subsystems, the motherboards, the disk drives, and the lot of interesting stuff with storage that happened here. That all need to have a venue you know, to get to the public. And except for open compute, there never was such a venue. And, and Intel had specs on the motherboard size, you know, like ATX cards and the power supply against the stainless, but that was it. So the industry never had a forum that allowed open hardware standardization until open compute. So it is a major uh, improvement how the industry can work and innovate going forward. Sure. 
affect what's posted on the internet. Yeah, and then people have to be able to get together and just say, let's do something, and this makes sense, and you know, it's good either for Facebook or Google or Microsoft, it doesn't matter, but there's, there's no barrier to innovation like we've seen in some of these industries. And what we've seen time and again is that open you know, an open source project then feeds the commercial world. People take these ideas and then, um, and then take them to all sorts of other customers, um, and, and you think that will happen with the storage as well, and then, yeah. So we think storage is the next wave. Uh, I think storage is the next wave to get transformed the way that servers have been and the way that networking is being transformed now. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll break a couple of our companies. Uh, we have a company called Maxnet, uh, which is basically we think of as Asira of storage, so software defined storage, uh, in the same way that Asira was software defined networking. And then Coco Data, which is basically what Cumulus is for uh, networking hardware, um, Coco is for um, basically bare metal uh, uh, storage hardware. Um, and so, and then, you know, these are two companies, there will be obviously a whole bunch of others, um, but we think that exact same kind of innovation um, is going to happen. Um, and then we think, like you probably, we think that there's, there's a fourth cycle that happens, so after service networking and storage gets swept through, there's actually a fourth cycle that happens, which the previous speaker uh, was, was, was alluding to, which is, uh, what I think is going to happen in the long run is the grand unification of the smartphone supply chain and the incident supply chain. Um, and I'm not radical on this. I think that data centers in 10, 15, 20 years are going to be running many of the same components as running smartphones. Um, and I think the, uh, the ARM based processor is, you know, sort of case study number one, and flash storage is case study number two. Um, and I think those are coming very quickly, and then those will come sweep back through uh, servers that ultimately network and storage. It's interesting, even here at the conference dedicated to change, you talk to a lot of people who will say the opposite the ARM is not going to happen. Um, if you talk to 50 people will say one thing, 50 people will say another. Where do you come down? Is it is well, going to happen? Our ARM 32 bit was kind of limited in terms of memory addressing, let's be honest. ARM 64 bit is a you know, solved that problem. The other thing is, you know, the world needs higher clock rates. So a cell phone is like at a gigahertz or 1.2. What really needs, you know, two, two and a half to three, that makes it a lot more interesting. And, um, you know, so well, these things are sort of in, in flight or in flux, and, and I don't know exactly when they're coming out, there because there were some announcements here earlier today. Um, but uh, there's definitely a race towards, you know, the lowest power, highest performance, highest cost performance kind of metrics. And the, the big advantage in the cloud is that many people own their own software stack. They're not limited to what's available from commercial third-party ISVs. They have this stack, and they can recompile that to ARM. If, if it really makes sense. So it's likely to happen when it makes sense. So the reason I saw I should say, the reason I saw all this on ARM in the data center, I mean, yes, and Andy's points are totally valid, of course, and, and the AMD announced yesterday the first eight core 64 bit ARM server chip, which is very exciting. Interesting, yeah. Very, very interesting. Um, every large scale internet service that I'm aware, that I'm aware of, um, they're all uh, incredibly bound by the cost of the data center. And within the data center, they're, they're from an architecture standpoint, they're IO bound. Um, so we deal with very few internet applications at scale that are CPU bound, as contrasted with IO bound. Um, and then, of course, the way the economics work are is all about power um, and cooling and efficiency and space in the data center. Um, and so the opportunity uh, with ARM servers, or ultimately with much more power efficient servers, uh, server chips coming from other other vendors, including Intel, um, the opportunity exists for like another 5x reduction uh, in data center cost uh, by packing a lot more server chips into the same data center. Um, and I think, especially for these IO bound applications, I think the transition, I think the transition would be more seamless than people think of it. If you can say one thing, so in defense of Intel, <laughs> they've done a remarkably good job to leverage their, their advanced technologies like 15 nanometer into power reduction, more cores, more IO bandwidth, and so on. So Intel is a tough competitor here. Needless to say, an ARM would have to do better than what Intel is doing to, you know, to make that point. Yeah, and I think the, I think the, the biggest CEO of Intel seems highly focused on, on this. You make a good point. I mean, Intel's going to drive down you know, power as well and, uh, and offer improved efficiency. But are there other reasons to use it? I mean, is it? Is it good to have a situation where you have multiple suppliers? Does but that drive down your cost? It's, of it's, I, I, don't, I don't think it's a philosophical issue. It's really a practical issue of having competition in the market. Right? If there was no competition, Intel may slack off and work more slowly. They're actually not doing that. They're working really hard. But the point I'm making is you need competition to keep the innovation going. And, most law, which predicted that transistors will bubble every, uh, every year, is still going on. So, at the rate of progress, you know, this data center that costs, I don't know, you know, a billion dollars today, it will actually only cost ten million dollars in ten years from now. It's that much of a cost reduction, like a factor of hundred for the same compute throughput. Of course, what people will do is they will get a hundred times more throughput out of the same investment. But you know, we're looking at a factor of hundred cost performance improvement in ten years based on Moore's law. 
and you know people want it and need it, and that will enable the next generation of applications. Well, the other question here is, um, you know, we've seen um, you know big big uh, cloud companies, Google, Amazon on down, design their own own gear. We talked about servers, and we talked about storage and networking. Um, could they, in fact, design their own chips? ARM is different from Intel in that it licenses out its designs, and that would allow a Google or a Facebook um, to go even further into the hardware. Um, is that a possibility? Yeah, so um, you can see, not, not long term to this vision. In, if you look at the cost of doing stuff, defining a rank, like the open compute rank, there was, was a discrete effort behind it, but it was nothing compared to the cost of making a chip. To make a very advanced 14 on your chip, I'm sure it was even more than 100 million dollars. So somebody has to spend that money to make those chips, and they want the margin, and there's a business model attached to that. So what really happens is, you know, people are trying to place their chips in the best way, along with the low clock rate. It's a very complex optimization to get the most mileage out of these investments, which are getting more expensive in each generation. So chips basically need super high volume, and even the volume that a Google or Facebook had, it, it may justify doing your own chip. But at the end, it, it, it's better if the whole industry buys the same production because you can leverage that initial R&D investment across a larger base. So in the end, we have to make lots and lots of chips to, to justify the upfront investment. So, so as many of you may know, um, in addition to backing innovative storage and networking companies, Mark is a big supporter of Bitcoin, the increasingly popular digital currency. So the most important question today is, how soon until we see an open compute Bitcoin miner? So, anybody I mean, yeah, so there's tons of innovation. Um, there's tons of innovation going on. Uh, actually, very interesting. So, Bitcoin mining, right, is, is the heart of Bitcoin, right, which is all the computation basically done to maintain the trust network. And the press kind of reports mining is just, just gigantic waste of time. Um, but in reality, it's, it's all the proof of work computation that actually makes the distributed uh, trust network work. Uh, and in, in the long run, I think there's really, I think there's really good reasons now to kind of project forward, say, in the long run, distributed mining systems like Bitcoin. Uh, in the long run, uh, you know, are a certain alternative, if not an outright replacement, to centralized uh, entities like banks and stock exchanges. And so there's sort of a very, very big thing going on uh, with mining that we're in the very early stages of. Uh, there's a ton of work going into optimizing uh, Bitcoin mining, uh, which is a you know, very straightforward formula the cheaper you can do it, the more money you make. Um, and so there's a ton of work going on in certain server configurations, data center configurations. We're seeing pitches for you know, Bitcoin optimized data centers. Uh, what on chips is where it gets really interesting is we're not seeing fundamental innovation in fundamental uh, new chip designs uh, around Bitcoin mining where there's, because of the nature of mining, there's a big opportunity uh, to apply post silicon. Um, and so we're seeing a new wave of uh, really interesting new ideas in chip design uh, uh, around it, which is not something that I would have predicted even a year ago. And, and, and in fact, I would say, I think what's, what's happening in mining right now, I suspect what's happening right now is mining is looking the other way um, from, from a lot of what's happening in the industry, which I think the specialized chips are going to be, at least for like a five-year period, much more efficient than the general purpose chips, because mining is a very specific thing that you can highly parallelize. Um, and so I think the custom mining chips are likely to dominate mining uh, for quite a while. And in your mind, in the mind of many others, this is not a niche market. I mean, the Bitcoin is analogous to the internet um, 20 years ago. I mean, you think that if this is going to be the way we do things financially. Um, and so the, the, the possibility of design shift for, for Bitcoin mines, that's no small thing. Yeah, so Bitcoin, Bitcoin's the first innovative cryptocurrency generally. Uh, the general concept is the first thing I've described like the internet since the internet. So I've been waiting 20 years to be able to say, ah, this is like the internet, and this is the first one uh, that I've seen. And the fundamental innovation, which is really critically important, is um, cryptocurrency generally and Bitcoin specifically are the first practical way for people to do business over the internet uh, with no prior relationship. Um, and with no central hub, uh, with no central broker, no central trust authority. Um, and so you and I want to exchange uh, money, we want to exchange title to a car or a house, we want to exchange a digital contract, uh, we want to exchange a stock or a bond, uh, we want to do it, and we've never met before, but we can do it over the internet, we can do it in a way where it's a unique digital asset, we can do it where everybody knows the exchange is taking place, uh, we can do it where everybody knows there's no level spending, we can do it where everybody can validate the transaction. Like that's never existed before. Like all e-commerce and payments and everything on the internet up until now has had to run through some kind of central authority. Um, this is the first really distributed way to do that. And so, you know, what you, all you really need to do is add up the number of people in the world times the number of transactions per year that they do, and then the number of crosswise connections, and then look at just the gigantic range of industries that exist today uh, in kind of legacy form to support all those transactions, and say, okay, now there is a better internet-based way to do all these things. Um, it seems like a very, very, very big opportunity 
Uh, so therefore, as a consequence, the amount of hardware that's going to get put behind it, or the amount of innovation that's going to, put, going to get put behind it is going to be gigantic. So all you hardware makers out there, that's your homework for next year, open compute, Bitcoin miners. That would more importantly, it would enable a whole new set of software applications yes, that would use this infrastructure to sell things or transact things. Yeah, we'll be sitting here, I'm quite confident we'll be sitting here in five or ten years, and this is how contracts will be done, and this is how, um, even digital keys, right? You, you, even uh, you know, services like Airbnb, I'm quite convinced in five years it's going to be, you use Bitcoin to send the key back and forth to be able to get into the house. Um, or, you know, ride sharing services like Lyft, uh, you know, to be able to share cars. Um, kind of applications all the way down to the level of an individual lock, and all the way up to things like stock exchanges and things. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody.